have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. The truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. Hey, look who's here. Maestro. And you, you couldn't play something good, huh? Hank Williams or something? They broke the door down before I could take requests. Was it worth it? Two weeks in the hall? <laughs> Easiest time I ever did. There's no such thing as easy time in the hall. That's right. A week in the hall is like a year. I had Mr. Mozart to keep me company. <laughs> so they let you tote that record player down there, huh? He's in here. In here. That's the beauty of music. They can't get that from you. Haven't you ever felt that way about music? Well, I played a mean harmonica as a younger man. Lost interest in it, though. Didn't make much sense in here. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget? Yeah, for, forget that there are places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's a, there's something inside that they can't get to, that they, they can't touch. It's yours. What are you talking about? Hope. Hope. Let me tell you something, my friend. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. You better get used to that idea. Like Brooks did. There's a harsh truth to face. No way I'm going to make it on the outside. Only one thing stops me. A promise I made to Andy. Dear Red, if you're reading this, you've gotten out. And if you've come this far, Maybe you're willing to come a little further. You remember the name of the town, don't you? Say what to nail. I could use a good man to help me get my project on wheels. I'll keep an eye out for you and the chessboard ready. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. I will be hoping that this letter finds you, and finds you well. Your friend, Andy. Get busy living, or get busy dying. I find I'm so excited I can barely sit still or hold a thought in my head. I think it's the excitement only a free man can feel. A free man at the start of a long journey, whose conclusion is uncertain. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope.
when people write their top 10 greatest movies or favorite movies of all time, usually Shawshank Redemption is somewhere between 1 and 10 on just about every list from critics and fans alike. And what's interesting, if you read the write-ups on why it's such a well-loved film, uh, some people will cite the acting, and it's you know, Morgan Freeman's best role of all that he does. It's uh, you know, his narration throughout. Others will just talk about the storyline and how it's a storyline that everybody can identify with. Uh, and very few really get at what the essence of it is. And that is, it taps into a core need that all of humanity has, yet very few people even acknowledge or understand how deep of a need it is. And it's a need for hope. Uh, in, in the movie, there's sort of the metaphor that goes along, and of course it's a metaphor that connects with life, and that, you know, in the same way that they're in prison ho hoping one day to be out of prison where there's a freedom that they can experience, uh, we in life are sort of imprisoned in this body, imprisoned with all of these struggles and trials that we go through with a hope for maybe something happening better in the life to come, somewhere out there, if you will. And the thing about it is, is humanity knows we need hope, but we don't really know where to find it outside of a relationship with God. And so if you do not acknowledge your God or do not have an understanding of God, what do you look to for hope? And so movies like this, where Hollywood kind of gives some idea, some sense that maybe there's something to hope in out there or put it out there, taps into people, but it still makes them wonder what really is you know, out there to hope in. It's been said that you can go a few weeks without food, you can go a few days without water, you can go a few minutes without air, but you won't last a second in life without hope. It is that core to the essence need of humanity. Now, we, talked, we looked to the, this last week and what this whole series is about. It's about these issues of faith, hope, and love. And if you look into the New Testament, there's 27 books in the New Testament. 20 of those 27 books are letters. 13 of those 20 books are written by a guy named Paul. And when Paul writes a letter, uh, he use, always uses the same format. And actually, I think all 20 letters use about the same format because it was their standard letter writing format. You'd write who it's from, who it's to. Uh, there would be a note of greetings, usually grace and peace to you. And then right after that, there'd be a message of thanksgiving. And whenever Paul would write the message of thanksgiving, he would always highlight three issues, faith, hope, and love. And it was his measures of spiritual maturity. Now, what's interesting about that is a lot of us, we would not tend to think of those three things for measures of spiritual maturity. Oftentimes we think of giftedness or Bible knowledge or other kinds of skills. Whereas for Paul, he looked at it and said the true measure of how much you've grown spiritually is to what degree is your faith, hope, and love. And so a great example of this, of course, is the letter to 1 Thessalonians where he says in the opening chapter, right after he gives his name and who he's writing to and the grace and peace line, right after that comes, we remember before God and our Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance uh, inspired by hope. And so he talks about faith, hope, and love. So it's a great church, Thessalonian church. Last week he looked at the uh, Corinthian church, which he doesn't mention faith, hope, and love till the 13th chapter. Why? Because they were so immature. Chapter 3, he says, you guys are a bunch of babies. And throughout the book, we find out why they were such a bunch of babies. They thought they were spiritually mature because of their giftedness, but when it came to faith, hope, and love, they had none of them. So he says, could we at least start with love? So back to hope. Hope is kind of the redheaded stepchild, if you will, of Christian virtues. And I don't even know if he, any, do we even still use that phrase? Is that politically incorrect? If, it, maybe, uh, sorry if you're red-haired. Uh, I think it's a reference to the movie Annie, which I think keeps getting reiterated over and over again. You know, Annie's the unwanted child in the movie, right? That's kind of what hope is. And it's, it's, it's that for a couple reasons. For the secular world, because they don't really know what to put their hope in, so to speak. We know we need it. We certainly know to put it in. But there's two reasons. One of them sounds biblical, or we think it's biblical, uh, but it's not. We'll get to why. Uh, and the other one is because the English grammar fails us. And the reason why the first one is, is actually because of the second one. And what I mean by that is a lot of folks know, if you've been in church a while, you may have heard of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for with the evidence of things not seen, right? So if you read that verse and you understand hope the way we understand hope in the English, it sounds like what it's saying is that faith is kind of next level hope. Like a lot of people hope that there's a heaven. A lot of people hope in God, but because we have a relationship with Jesus, we know there is, and so therefore we've moved from hope to faith. So hope is for all you folks who have a little bit of uncertainty, but once you know that you know that you know, well, then you graduate from hope on to faith. So it seems like as if faith is the maturity of hope, right? And if faith is the maturity of hope, then what point of, is it to have hope, right? 
Not when you can have faith. But if that was the case, then answer this question. Why is it that Paul examines your Christian maturity not based on faith and hope, or sorry, not just based on faith and love, but faith, hope, and love? I mean, if faith is the maturity of hope, then why even bother examining somebody's hope? Well, the reason for this is because our English language fails us. And because our English language fails us, we misunderstand Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And what I mean by that is when we talk about hope in the English language, uh, we typically talk about it uh, with some degree of uncertainty. In other words, there is sort of two levels of hope. There is the complete uncertainty, kind of the poke and hope strategy, like when somebody's shooting pool and they just you know, randomly, and they just hope a ball goes in because they hit it hard enough, right? Uh, where we just hope something will happen. Uh, this is the dumb and dumber moment where he says, so you're telling me there's a chance, right? That is an extremely overly optimistic person who, it's when you're running late and, and you hope you get every light green on Farrell Parkway, you know, going to the interstate, right? You know it's not going to happen, but you hope so anyway, right? Right? Or, or, or you Redskin fans, Every year, you know, this is our year, going to the Super Bowl. I mean, come on, is there any more unfounded, unlikely hope than that? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, we actually have a shot, unlike your Patriots, now that the Brady has left on, moved on. You know, so there's, there's this highly uncertain speculative hope. But then you can graduate from that to what we might call expected hope. And expected hope is where I've done some things to increase my probability of actually seeing the thing I hope for happen. So maybe somebody applies to a college and you say, what do you think? Do you think you're going to get it? Well, I, I hope so. I've got really good grades that are competitive and I've got some pretty good test scores. So I really think I have a good shot. I hope I get accepted. See, I've, I've done some things to increase my odds. Or do you think you'll make rank? Well, I don't know. I, I hope so. I've got an EP on just about every eval for the past couple of years. So I really you know, think that I look pretty good for the board. I've got a lot of requisites. So I really hope I make promotion, right? That's kind of what we, we hope. Or you might say, you know, I've knocked out everything on my honey-do list, and she's in a good mood, so, you know, I, I hope, you know, it'll be a good night. Um, but none of those are the way that hope is used throughout the New Testament, or at least the predominant use of hope in the New Testament. In the New Testament, hope is a certainty. There's no uncertainty about it. The hope that we have is a certain hope, if you will, even to the extent where uh, when the New Living Translation translates the word hope, most of the time, they'll have to insert the word certain. They'll say, this certain hope we have. Why? Because in our English, we think of it as a sense of, like, hope almost instinctively has inherently an uncertainty about it. But that's not the way the word is used in the biblical writing. There is a certainty about it. There is, there is a, we know that we know that we know where our future ends up. We know that this life is about nothing more than a living relationship with Jesus Christ that we'll enjoy for all eternity. That is the hope that we have. That's the hope that gets us to endure difficult circumstances uh, and the things that we might go through. In the same sense that you might say, well, you know, and I know that this job is only for three months and it's really hard and it's really difficult, but I know they're sending me to Hawaii next. Maybe, right? You're a detailer. You don't really always know. Um, but if you knew that, you know, you might be excited about it. Or if you knew that there was a promotion coming as a result, because of what you know is coming, you can endure what you're going through now. That's the way hope is used in the New Testament. And there's two senses of this hope. There's sort of the hope this side of eternity and hope for eternity. The hope this side of eternity, we see in verses like Psalm 27, 13. I would have despaired. Despair is the opposite of hope. I would have despaired if I didn't believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord once again in my lifetime. Or Jeremiah 29, 11. God looks at you and says, I know the plans I have for you. I, I'm certain. I, I know it. In the same way you know what you're doing next week, you've got it on your calendar, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's, I, I, that's my plans. I, I, I have a hope for you, and I have a future for you, and I know those plans. But then there's also the hope for eternity, the hope that we look forward to. We see that over in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. He says, we take hold of the hope that's offered to us, and we are greatly encouraged by the certain hope of being saved, which is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. He uses this metaphor of an anchor. An anchor is something that ships would put down in the midst of violent storms that they knew if they had the anchor deep enough and grounded in something solid enough, the ship would be able to stay there uh, no matter what storm came. It would be able to weather the storm because of the anchor that it has. And says hope, true biblical hope, is the certainty like an anchor is that will help you weather whatever storm life puts you through. 
That's the kind of picture he has. And later on in the book of Hebrews, he'll say, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we have. In other words, let's not lose sight of this. Let's not lose our grasp of this. And I like this metaphor because hopes oftentimes are held to the ship by a rope. And if you've been around Essential for some time, I talk about hope in the sense of a rope, the rope of hope, if you will. Uh, and that's where this rope over here is always over here in the corner, always to remind us. And this rope is really meant to be a picture of your life, your life as it truly is. And if this is your entire existence as it, as, it, as it is, this little piece right here is what most people call life. And if you could get really close and see this, I don't know if the camera can zoom in on this. There's one little section here, it's, it's used with orange tape on this one. This is your growing years, this is the years you're in school. And you see, when you're in each one of these sections, you think that's your whole life. So you probably have kids right now who are middle schoolers or they're in high school Right, and something happened, and they're devastated because their whole world and the whole school knows, and all the social media is blowing up, and their whole life is over and is ruined, all because something happened. And you're looking at them like, really? Because like, you've been to your high school reunion. You don't recognize half the people there. A lot of the people who used to you know, wonder what they think, thought of you or cared what they thought of you, you go, huh, I can't believe I ever cared what that person thought of me. Look how things turned out. Uh, oh, am I not the only one? Right. Um, so you look back on the high school years and you realize, now in light of all that I have lived, right, high school was so inconsequential, right? Oh, if I could only do it over again and realize how short-sighted I was now that I've lived these 50 years, right? So now we're in the Middle Ages and now you, your, your life is wrapped up in, you know, making a few bucks and getting ahead and getting an advancement and getting promotions and getting the next deal done and moving on ahead in life and everything is about the rat race that you're in, all in the hopes of paying off the mortgage and someday paying down the debts and someday being debt free and someday being able to retire. Oh, because those are going to be the golden years. And so you spend this whole time focused on living in the moment and the here and now because it's all you can see. And then you get to the golden years, and those people are hard to understand. They look at you and they say, just come over for dinner. It's okay. And you're like, you don't understand all the stuff I got to do. It doesn't matter. You see, they're looking at you with a different perspective now because they're here in this area, and they see that you know, they don't have long for this world, and the time and the people and the relationships are what matter most, and their perspective changes because how long they lived. And so most of us, at best, are living with this kind of a perspective on life, that this is our life. Let's think about the end in mind. Let's think about all 70 years and how you want to be able to spend your retirement. And scriptures point to, no, 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 this life isn't all there is. This is just the first 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of all eternity. And in light of all eternity, when you really live with the certainty of the hope that everybody lives somewhere forever and there is an eternity that awaits, you can begin to understand a picture of this. This is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. He says this. I'm in chapter 4, verse 16. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Anybody outwardly wasting away? I don't know if you can see. I've got a knee brace on underneath my pants right now because my knee's been on the verge of buckling at any given time. I'm afraid that my knee's going to give out and I'm going to collapse. And so I didn't want to put you through that traumatic experience of watching that live, so I figured I'd put on the brace this morning. We are outwardly wasting away. Our bodies are not going to make it uh, past 100 years or so. And then he says, but inwardly we're being renewed day by day. And then he says this, for our light and momentary troubles. Now you might go, well, easy for you to say, Paul, you, don't, you haven't walked a mile in my shoes. Really? Read Paul's life. You can read about that over in 2 Corinthians 11. How many times he's been beaten and tortured and whipped, uh, thrown overboard, almost drowned in the open sea, been marooned on islands. He's gone through some stuff, okay? He's watched a lot of his closest friends die. He's been threatened with his life. He's been in prison over and over and over again throughout his life, you know, brought up on false charges, beaten uh, mercilessly by uh, corrupt authorities, uh, people wanting bribes from him. Trust me, he's walked a few miles, and he calls all of that, he goes, it was our light and momentary troubles. Really? Light and momentary? What do you mean light and momentary? And he says, his light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. What's he looking at? What's fueling his endurance? What's fueling his perseverance? It's the fact that he has a perspective of all eternity. He who dies with the most toys still dies. But we all go to eternity. And so often I'll hear, hear people say, you know, oh, well, life's too short to put up with that. You know, life is really short, though. In light of all eternity, is life really too short to put up with something for a short while, these light and momentary troubles? And he goes on and says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on that first little part of the rope, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is 
temporary. High school is temporary. Your job is temporary. Eventually you'll retire and your wife will ask you to hang up all those stuff and not clutter up all the walls with all of those things and all those boxes and all those ribbons. Please put those away. We got guests coming over. I want to decorate the house, okay? Eventually it'll all end. It'll all be over. It'll all go away. Even your retirement savings, everything will all go away. He says, but what is unseen is eternal. Live for eternity. Live with eternity in mind is what he's getting at. Now, there's two letters I want to focus in on this morning, uh, which were letters to churches that were struggling with the issue of hope. And so we looked at last week at First, uh, at first Corinthians, how they were struggling with all three, with uh, issues of, of faith, hope, and love. Uh, we're going to now look at Ephesians and Thessalonians. So he starts off to the letter to the, Thess- or to the Ephesians, and he says in Ephesians 1, he says, grace and peace to you. And then the next thing he says, uh, and all praise be to God, our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And then he goes into like this long explanation of stuff. And then you get to verse 15. And then he finally says, ever since I first heard of your strong faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. What's missing? Hope. Yep. It's, it's the message of the day. Yeah, good. Um, uh, he says, um, I have not stopped asking God, the glorious Father, Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. And here it is. And I pray that your hearts may be enlightened so you can understand the hope that he's given to those he's called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. There it is. So he says, you're doing good with the faith, you're doing good with love, but you need to, you need to work on this hope. I'm really praying that you understand the certainty of your hope. So if you go through the book of Ephesians, what the issue is in the church is, the church is made up of a blended group of people from different backgrounds. Uh, there is one group that grew up Jewish, and they've been Jewish since birth, and they grew up with all the understandings and theology of Judaism. There's the other group in the church which grew up with the uh, pagan pantheon of either Greek or Roman gods and goddesses. We call those things uh, Roman and Greek mythology. Maybe you studied those in English class at some point in time. Uh, we might call them mythology or the stories, but for them, that was their religion. That was the practice religion of the day. And so a lot of people grew up with that. Now, both of these groups are now in the church. Well, at the core essence of Jewish theology are some things that are really hard to move on from. And maybe some of you grew up with some theological beliefs, and even though you've been coming to Essential for a while, you still struggle to not think the same things you always thought. There's many of you who grew up Catholic, and as you come forward for communion, you can't help but cross yourself before you come up. It's just old habits die hard. Old theologies die hard. It's just a constant practice, right? So for Jewish theology or Jewish thought, uh, it was ingrained in their mind from the earliest of age that we are Abraham's children. And because of that, we are loved by God and we are chosen by God. We are his chosen people. Uh, We are called to be holy as he is holy. And because we are God's chosen people and because we are God's children, uh, the inheritance that was promised to Abraham is ours by birthright. That was what they believed. Well, now in comes these other folks who didn't grow up with Judaism. And the Jews would look at them and say, well, I don't know about you guys. You know, clearly we're God's chosen and clearly Jesus came for us. And it's kind of cute and all that you have a relationship with Jesus, but I don't really know what that means for your future because we're God's children and we have God's inheritance. I'm not really sure if he's included you in that at all or not. We're not really sure about that. And so it created this doubt about the certainty of the hope. And so that was the issue in the church in Ephesus. And this all kind of comes up to a crescendo. There's a passage over in chapter 4 that whenever somebody's talking about unity or oneness in a church, they will almost always make a beeline for Ephesians chapter 4 because this is what this book is all about. He's trying to tell them, listen, you guys are all one group of people. God looks at all of you the same regardless of where you came from, regardless of where you grew up. And so he comes to this conclusion in chapter 4. He says, We are all parts of one body. We have the same spirit, and we've all been called to the same glorious future. For there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and we all have the same God and Father who is over all of us uh, and living through every one of us. There it is. He's kind of saying, listen, it doesn't matter your background. We're all, it's all the same God, and it's all the same faith. So let me go back to chapter one. I said there was like a little sentence he, like a little thing he mentioned before he got to the faith, hope, and love. Well, Everything in that sentence that he says right before the faith, hope, and love is all about this issue. Now, a couple of things about this. Uh, In the... Must be a service dog or somebody's got a lot of jewelry on. Uh, So in... uh, in, (laughs) 
in Ephesians, what happens is he writes this one sentence just kind of as a preface to the issue of faith, hope, and love. Now, when I say one sentence, in your translation, it may be multiple sentences, it may even be multiple paragraphs, but in the Greek, it's one sentence. It's one thought that he's getting out. It is the, I think it is the longest sentence in the Bible, actually. And so he starts, I think, in verse 3 and goes all the way down to verse 14, and it's all one continuous thought. Now, as you would read through it, if you didn't grow up Jewish, you probably would not pick up on all the buzzwords. Uh, but if you're a part of a culture or community, there are buzzwords in every culture, every community has them, right? You military folks, you've got all kinds of buzzwords that mean something. Earlier when I mentioned that, you know, you've got an EP on all your fit reps and, you know, you're looking to the boards. That means something to you who grew up in the military, or you've been in the military. For you who didn't know anything about the military, you're like, what's an EP? Is that like an album that's coming out, like an EP, an LP? No, it's an early promote. It, it, there's language in there. If you grew up in church, you probably have some buzzwords maybe associated with your denomination. Maybe if I talk about confession, or if I talk about the sacraments, or if I talk about Mary, if I talk about holiness, or if I talk about full gospel, if I talked about baptism, or a second baptism, or baptism in the Spirit, or a full gospel, or a holiness church, those all mean something. Or do you, are, you, are you a sovereign grace church? All those things mean something to different denominational groups. Does that make sense? And so if I begin to teach or preach and I drop these buzzwords in, sometimes I can drop them in and the people who I'm targeting will pick up on them, whereas everybody else is just going to go right over their head. Well, he's going to drop about every buzzword you can imagine when it comes to Judaism in this opening section. He's going to talk about children because they believe they were children of Abraham. He's going to talk about being holy because core tenant of Judaism was be holy as your father in heaven is holy. That was a core tenant from the Old Testament carryover. He's going to talk about their inheritance. He's going to talk about how their rights as sons of God. Uh, talk about chosen is going to be in there because they say we're a chosen people. He's going to use all of that language to kind of, you know, sort of ping off all the things on the list to make sure the Jews are paying attention, okay? So as I'm reading this, know that that's what's happening in this section. And so he's going to say this, uh, verse 4, even before God made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. You begin to hear some of these buzzwords? He says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. And so we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace. That is another phrase. For God is, you know, grace is a compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. That's, that's throughout the old, whole Old Testament. He says this to Jonah, says it over in Deuteronomy. That phrase will come up over and over again, so he's pulling that buzz phrase out. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he has purchased our freedom with the blood of his son to forgive our sins. He has showered us in his kindness along with all wisdom and all understanding. And God has now revealed to us the mystery of his will regarding Christ which is to fulfill his own good plan, and this is the plan, that at the right time he'll bring everything under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Now, when he's saying that word, he's talking about everyone, like everybody, everybody on heaven and on earth, everything, every creature, every being, everybody from every background is all being brought together. He's trying to give them that idea. He says, furthermore, we are united with Christ, and we've received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, which he makes everything work according to his plan. Now, for the people listening to this, because these letters were read out loud to the group of the church as a whole. The people are listening to this. Who do you think the Jews thought he was talking about every time he mentioned we or us? Them, right? Because we have a us and them mentality. It's kind of funny how that even holds true to this day, right? <laughs> we in the church, we believe these things, but those people out there believe that stuff, and they vote that way, and they believe those things, and they're kind of those folks over there, and they're not surely sure if God loves them the way he loves us because it's an us and them sort of mentality, us and them society, that we still have these same ideas. Well, for them, the us and them of their day and time was we the Jews, all the rest of you out there. And so he's using all these we and us terms, and then when he gets to this part of the sentence, all still one sentence, he's going to make sure he clarifies who the we and the us is. Because what he's saying to them is all these things that you think you have as a birthright, you have all of those things ultimately because of what Jesus Christ did. All these things that you thought was going to happen, all these things that God promised you, all come to a fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ isn't just for you only. He's for everybody. And because he's for everybody, everybody gets a share in the promise. That's what he's going to say. So he goes on and he says this. He continues, And God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles also have heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you too. And when you believed in Christ, now talking very clearly about the Gentiles, and when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. 
And God's Spirit is a guarantee that He will give us the inheritance that He promised, that He purchased us to be His own people. And He did this so we would praise and glorify Him. What's He clearly saying? This whole notion that only the Jews are the ones loved by God is garbage. Get rid of that old theology. God loves everybody. In the same way that you Jews are children of God, you're only children of God through Jesus Christ. And guess what? Jesus came for everybody because, as he says in Ephesians 4, as he gets all the way to the top of his his argument, because there is just one God, and there's one body, there's one spirit, there's one Baptist working through everybody. And so everybody gets the same inheritance. We can all have assurance of our hope. Don't let anybody back you down or tell you that just because you didn't grow up in church, you haven't been here enough, or you didn't come from this denomination, or you didn't do these rituals, that you are somehow less than or other than when it comes to your spiritual future. Everybody has a hope guaranteed to us through Jesus Christ who have a relationship with him. That's what he's getting across. Now over in the church, the letter to the Thessalonians, to the second Thessalonians, uh, he says this, um, uh, now, you might be going, wait a minute, I thought you just said that the Thessalonian church was doing really good with their faith, hope, and love, right? You just read me that verse, 1 Thessalonians 1, where he says, your work pr- pr- uh, produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope. What's the issue? Well, he also writes to them another letter, 2 Thessalonians, which came after 1 Thessalonians. You come to me for the biblical insights, and there's one of them. So he writes 1 Thessalonians, and then he writes 2 Thessalonians afterwards, and he says this in 2 Thessalonians. Um, he says, uh, first chapter one, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. There's a standard introduction to his letter. And then he says, we must give thanks to God for you always, Christian brothers. It is the right thing to do because your faith is growing so much and your love for each other is growing stronger all the time. And then he goes on into his letter. And you're like, wait a minute. Faith, love, something's missing. What's missing? Hope. hope. Very good. You guys are getting it. All right. So you get to chapter two and you find out why the hope is missing. This is kind of funny. He says, all right, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, don't be easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching that was allegedly from us. In other words, somebody else has come and you know, told you something that came from me, but it didn't come from me. He says, whether it was by a, by like a prophecy of word of mouth or by a letter, somebody, somebody told you something, whether they told it to you, you know, to your ears or whether you read something that they said was from me, it wasn't from me. He says, uh, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So what is he saying here? Somebody came and told us, like, yeah, Jesus is coming back. It happened two months ago. You missed it. And they're like, oh, we missed it? Oh, no. Like, we're left behind. We better watch those Kirk Cameron movies to, to figure out what we got to do now. <laughs> See, that was a buzzword. Some of y'all who grew up in Christian culture got the joke. Some of y'all did. That's okay. There was a whole series of books called the Left Behind Books, which is all about the people who were left behind. Well, somebody came and told the Thessalonian church that they were left behind. And so they're freaking out because, oh yeah, God's coming back, but we got left behind. So what are we hoping now? Because, you know, our chance at eternity has all been missed. He's like, no, 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 no. You haven't been left behind, all right? And he goes in and he says, you remember what it is I told you. And he goes back. If you go back to chapter four, you remember what he told you. He says, listen, we don't want you to grieve like those who have no hope, uh, those who don't believe or don't understand that Jesus Christ is coming back, I want you to know, here's how it's going to happen. He's going to come back, that in Christ will be risen from the dead, uh, and we will gather together with him and be caught up into heaven. It hasn't already happened. You haven't missed anything. And so he says, the reason why you don't have hope is because you were told a lie. He hasn't come back yet. It's going to come. It just hasn't happened yet. So you can see how their hope was challenged. And that's where he goes into the rest of the book for Second Thessalonians. So I say all that to get down to the question then is, as I mentioned last week, if the letter was being written to you, what would Paul say about your hope? Do you have this sense where you're living every day and every day is in light of eternity? Whether, no matter which phase of life you're in, whether, you know, you're here in middle school, high school, preschool, whatever it may be, are you still living in light of eternity? If you're into the grind and the rat race of of the every days of growing a family and trying to achieve achieve the American dream, do you still live with life all in light of eternity? As your health is failing and you're struggling to enjoy the golden years, are you still living your life in light of all eternity? Or do you struggle with the certainty of the hope that God wants you to have? How about if you're going through difficulties or trials or going through something that's struggling, do you have the ability to look at as the light and momentary troubles that, that pales in comparison to the surpassing glory of everything that awaits? Do you, do you have the kind of hope that you really look to and say, God, in light of everything is to come, life is too short to not endure whatever it is I have to face in the days and weeks to come? Do you have a sense of that God's best, that my best days are still to come, that God still has a hope and a future for me, that 
that I can do all things through him who's called me uh, to his purpose, that he's going to work all things for my good someday, that, that I don't have to despair because I, I will see God's goodness once again in my lifetime, and he'll restore all of the things that have been broken in my life. He'll redeem that which I have messed up. Do you still have a belief in the, 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 the hope that still comes this side of eternity and God's goodness and his grace over your life? To what extent are you, do you know that because you have a loving relationship with Jesus Christ, that you will spend all eternity with him and that that's what this life is all about. It's not about he who dies with the most toys or what you have or who you get or who you marry or any of these things. It's all ultimately about the loving relationship with Jesus Christ that you'll be able to enjoy for all eternity, which is better than anything that life can give us or anything that life can take from us because our hope in him is certain. How are you doing with the certainty of hope? We join with me as we close our time in prayer. Father, I thank you for your grace over us. I thank you, Lord, that even though we waver sometimes in our understanding of hope, even though sometimes our understanding of hope is riddled with all kinds of uncertainties or focusing so much on the things that we're going through, the, the difficulties we're going through, the troubles that we go through, the bad news that we hear or the problems that come to us every single day, we get so focused on our agendas and our schedules, Father, it's hard to live each day in light of eternity. But Father, let us be reminded of the hope that we have in you, that this world is not our home, none of this is going to last, the only thing that lasts is our relationship with you and the people that we've shared you with, that we'll have a loving relationship with you for all eternity. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.